Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome co-founder of Databricks, Andy Konwinski. Welcome to the Spark Summit. I'm super excited for this summit here in New York. Last time we were here, we were half this size. New York is an awesome place to have a Spark Summit. New York is to other cities like Matei Zaharia, the creative spark, is to other engineers. <laughs> New York is the definition of a great city, and it's a perfect spot for a Spark Summit. Before I introduce Matei, who will give our first keynote, I want to ask you a question. Why are you here? What do you hope to take home with you from this summit? Are you hoping to find use cases in the industrial track this afternoon? Data science, machine learning, or just to meet the creator and the committers? Whatever reason you're here, the next two days are going to satisfy that. We've got talks lined up in the afternoon in parallel tracks, and we've got keynotes in the morning. Our keynote this morning, the first one, will be by Matei Zaharia. Creative Spark, and he'll be talking to us about another number that's doubled in size. We're going from Spark 1.0 to 2.0. And Matei will tell us about all the great things that are on the horizon of Spark 2.0. Matei is also, in addition to creating Spark, a professor at MIT and one of the co founders and CTO at Databricks. Welcome, Matei. Thanks, Andy, and uh, welcome everyone to Spark Summit East. Um, it's really exciting to be out here and to see so many people um, here in New York. Um, so, um, uh, you know, so welcome again. Um, so uh, I'm uh, excited to talk to you today about Spark 2.0, which will be the next major release of Spark. And um, before that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened in 2015. So 2015, as I think a lot of people are aware, um, was a really, really great year for Spark. And a lot of the, uh, the numbers in the community, a lot of the use cases have gone up uh, very significantly. So just some statistics from 2015 compared to the year before. Uh, just the attendees to Spark Summit almost quadrupled. In 2014, uh, we had uh, our second Spark Summit actually in, in San Francisco. We had around 1,000 people. And in 2015, uh, we went to three locations, including New York and Amsterdam. Uh, and we went up to 4,000 uh, total attendees. Um, the number of meetup members in smaller meetup groups throughout the, con uh, you know, throughout the world has also increased dramatically from 12,000 uh, at the end of 2014 uh, to around 60,000 at the end of 2015. Um, and finally, something I'm, I'm really excited about, the number of contributors to Apache Spark has also grown. So at the end of 2014, there had been 500 total contributors to the project. Uh, at the end of 2015, in December, we hit 1,000. And that means there were 500 new people who contributed code to Spark in 2015. So I'm super excited. You know, let's, let's give them all a round of applause to everyone who's contributed. Yeah. And it's, it's a great milestone for the project, and uh, I'm sure that we will uh, we'll continue this growth. Um, and to show, like, you know, just one snapshot of this, this is a map of all the meetup groups that uh, existed at the beginning of last year, um, you know, on meetup.com, and this is a map at the end. So we also opened meetups in a bunch of new, new continents and, and new places. Uh, and this is, you know, we still see a lot of new meetups starting, um, you know, every week. Uh, and uh, in, in the code itself, we got a whole lot of new components uh, produced last year and released, uh, including things like data frames, project tungsten, Spark R, machine learning pipelines, and lots of new uh, features that you know, people are starting to use right away. One of the things that's really exciting um, for uh, me as one of the developers of Spark is seeing how quickly people start to use uh, these new things and, and give feedback on them. 
Okay, so I want to talk though about Spark 2.0, and this is going to be the next major release that we'll make. Uh, it's slated to come in April or May, depending on how things line up. It's you know somewhere around the end of April, and uh, it builds on all the stuff we learned in the past two years. Um, and uh, so this is you know it, even though it is 2.0, it's not like a revamp of the whole project, uh, but it is a chance to, to tie together uh, some loose ends and also to, to add a bunch of really uh, nice and significant features. So because we had so many features coming in this release, we, you know, we, we decided to, uh, uh, to make the version number 2.0. So just so you understand how versioning works in Spark, this is how it's set up. So you have your version number with like three pieces. Uh, there's the major version. The main thing about major versions is that they may change APIs, uh, although we don't like to do that usually. Uh, but this is, this is what that is. Uh, there's the minor version. This can add APIs and new features, but it can't break uh, the existing ones. In fact, we keep not just API uh, compatibility, but binary compatibility with uh, the past release. Um, and then there's the patch version. This can only add bug fixes, no new features. Um, so in reality, even though 2.0 is a new major version, we really hate breaking APIs. You can ask anyone uh, who's worked with me on Spark how, <laughs> how much I push back on this. Uh, and it's because, you know, as, as a user, uh, the worst thing is like when you have something that works and then you upgrade one of your packages and it stops working. And, uh, you know, it's, you're just stuck. You can't do anything about it. So in 2.0, we're not just going to uh, break, uh, you know, lots of APIs. Uh, we will change a few of them, but in, in some pretty rare cases where they cause dependency conflicts. One example of that, uh, if you're familiar with the Java API, is the use of Guava, which is the Google Collections library. We use it for one really uncommon thing, which is options. And uh, the option class in Guava, even though it's a very simple class, if, if you're a programmer, uh, it's a collection with either zero or one element, uh, that is not backwards compatible across versions of Guava. So we're getting rid of that. Uh, but that's, these are the kind of changes that will happen. So hopefully for most users, the update to 2.0 is not going to be, uh, uh, you know, is not going to break uh, their code. So what are the actual features? I'm, there are lots of features coming in the release. I'm going to highlight three of them that I think are the most important. And uh, these are first the continuation of Project Tungsten to speed up uh, Spark, especially the structured data part of Spark. And we have some really cool optimizations that are landing in this release that will give speed ups of 5 to 10x for some uh, really important um, uses. Um, then we have structured streaming. This is uh, a higher level streaming API, similar to data frame, similar to Spark SQL. It's built on the structured data engine in Spark. And the other exciting thing about this is it's really meant to push Spark beyond just streaming to a new class of applications that uh, do, do other things in real time. They don't just analyze a stream and output another stream. And I'll talk more about that uh, later. And finally, we have unifying data sets and data frames. This is the most technical, but it creates a really nice foundation in the future for uh, the growth of the project. So let me start with Tungsten uh, sort of phase two. Um, so just the background on Project Tungsten, if you're not familiar, uh, you know, since Spark was released five years ago, hardware has changed a bunch. And the main thing that changed is that CPUs aren't really getting much faster, whereas I.O. has gotten much faster. So in a lot of big data applications, you know, the bottleneck used to be the network or the storage, but now it's increasingly the CPU. Now, how do we improve that? Uh, we want to make a large, as large part of uh, Spark as possible uh, execute really close to bare metal, uh, same way as native code. Uh, and basically, there are two pieces. There's native memory management, which bypasses uh, the Java VM. And there's runtime code generation. For a lot of high-level libraries, we generate expressions that will, um, uh, you know, that will run uh, fast on this native memory without creating lots of Java objects. Um, up to, uh, so Tungsten came out uh, last summer in Spark 1.4. And since uh, then, we've been adding basically uh, just this binary storage layer and basic code generation, which did provide a whole bunch of speed ups as well as improved robustness for uh, large memory workloads. Uh, and we also added two APIs, data frame and data set, that let you use tungsten in user programs. The, the key idea in these APIs is, you know, normally in the Spark API, you just had a bunch of Java objects 
objects floating around. And there wasn't that much we could do to optimize or to change the representation. In these APIs, you get uh, data with a, a known schema. And uh, even though you can have a shim on it that looks like Java objects, which is the data set API, we control the storage underneath, and uh, we can uh, do much more efficient execution for a lot of operations. Um, so it's also used in Spark SQL and parts of MLlib. Um, so what's coming next? So in 2.0, we have two really big optimizations. There's actually a talk about these uh, later today from Nang Li, so you can get a lot more detail. Um, the first is whole stage code generation. This, um, what this means is uh, it removes uh, the, the iterator calls between different operators in Spark, and basically, if you do a bunch of operators together, like a map and a filter and a group by, it fuses them all into one snippet of code that's optimized to do just these three operations, and that doesn't have any virtual calls. Um, and uh, that uh, uh, leads to some pretty significant speed up. So here's like a s simple example of a benchmark. This is just uh, processing data once it's in memory in Spark and um, uh, with a simple SQL query. And this improves by almost a factor of nine uh, through just better code generation. And the second thing we're optimizing is input and output. We found I.O. both from Parquet and from the columnar cache built into Spark isn't always uh, the most optimized. And uh, with a little bit of uh, work there, actually, I should say a, a bunch of work there, uh, we're able to make that quite a bit faster as well. So Parquet is the on-disk format we're focusing on at first, but the same things will apply to ORC and, and other formats in the future. Uh, and it's also about a factor of nine. And the really cool things about these is you don't have to change anything in your programs. It, it will automatically apply to SQL, data frames, data sets, you know, ML lib in many cases, anything that's built on Tungsten. So that's one of the things. Check out Nong's stock on optimizing Spark uh, this afternoon for more details. Um, second thing is structured streaming. This is one I'm really excited about. This is more on the new API side, but it does some really cool things. Um, so basically, we see real-time processing is, is increasingly important for a lot of Spark users and big data users in general. Um, but what we discovered, you know, talking with users of Spark streaming, is really most applications don't just need to do streaming. They're not just like, oh, here's a stream, you know, apply a map function and get another stream. Really, the most interesting applications and uh, the most important ones combine it with other types of data analysis. Um, including batch and interactive queries. And this is a thing that current streaming engines don't really handle. They're just built for streaming. They're just like, give me a stream in, I'll give you a stream out, that's it. Um, so just examples of other types of applications. A super common one we see in you know, pretty much all users of Spark streaming is I want to build up or track state using a stream. For example, I want to track sessions of users on my website, and then I want to run interactive queries on the state because it's real-time data. I have real-time questions to ask about it. Uh, but this is a combination of streaming and interactive that isn't really handled by current streaming engines. You have to put the data somewhere else and query it, and uh, it becomes is very operationally complex. Uh, another example is I train a machine learning model offline, and then I want to apply it to a stream or even update it using a stream. And again, you need an ML library that works across these things and maybe a system that can go back to the offline portion. So Spark is obviously very well suited to do this because it supports uh, all of these types of, um, of computation. And uh, in structured streaming, we, uh, we are also looking to make them super easy to combine. So what is structured streaming? It's a higher level streaming API that's built on the Spark SQL engine, uh, as well as a lot of the, the ideas in, in Spark streaming. Um, and um, it's a declarative API that extends data frames and data sets. So that means it can run over tungsten to get all those optimizations. Uh, it, uh, it can do a lot of optimizations on its own, like logical optimizations that you'd get there. And it has a bunch of higher level features than you currently have in Spark streaming, such as event time, out-of-order data can be handled using all the operators, um, windowing, different types of windowing, uh, very easy to create sessions, and a really rich API for data sources and syncs, uh, many of the same things that make uh, Spark SQL um, easy to use. 
But on top of doing streaming, it also supports interactive and batch queries in a way that no other streaming engine does. Um, and for example, you can do things like aggregate the data in a stream and then serve it using the Spark SQL JDBC server and just have ad hoc SQL queries that act on the latest state. It's super easy to do that uh, with Spark. Um, you can change the queries at runtime. You can add queries, remove them, and so on um, in, in this engine. And you can also build and apply machine learning models. And we're making most of the libraries in Spark um, interact with this in, in both the, the batch and streaming settings. So really the idea we want to do here, and I'll we'll talk about this more, is we don't just want to do streaming. We want to do what we're calling continuous applications, which is a, an end-to-end -end application, including, say, something that reads a stream and then serves queries off of it. And uh, there isn't really any single platform today that does that. So that's why I'm excited about that. Um, just to give a really small uh, picture, here are some things you can do with, uh, with uh, structured streaming. So classical streaming is, you know, you take in data from something like Kafka and you do maybe ETL, extract, transform, and load, basically a map function or a group by, and you stick it into some other system like a database. Uh, or sometimes streaming is about, okay, you do ETL, then you build a report, and then you serve it to some applications. Um, with structured streaming, you can also do the following. You can just do ad hoc queries on the same stream. No need to put it in some other weird storage system and worry about consistency among those. Um, so this stuff in orange is other processing types that isn't traditional streaming. And likewise, you can train, say, a machine learning model, maintain it. That might involve running a batch job once in a while, uh, and then serve it, apply it back to a stream. And again, it's very hard to do that with a purely streaming um, engine. So basically, the goal is to have these end-to-end -end, uh, continuous applications. So what's, uh, you know, how can you find more about structured streaming? You know, I'd love to talk about it more, but I don't have time this morning. So um, Spark 2.0 will have the first uh, cut at this, which will focus uh, most, mostly on ETL, but it will lay a lot of the groundwork for the other things. So hopefully, um, you'll get some of these other features too. Uh, later versions will add more operators and libraries. And uh, Reynolds keynote tomorrow morning will be just about structured streaming. Uh, and Michael Lombard also has a talk later tomorrow with even more details. So uh, I hope you stick around for tomorrow to hear about this. OK. And the final thing I want to talk about is data sets and data frames. Um, so these two APIs, you know, if you're not familiar, they're, they're pretty new, uh, but they're pretty exciting. We added these APIs as ways to work with structured data and Spark, mostly to enable the tungsten engine underneath and to enable us more control over memory layout uh, and execution so that we can get really fast execution on, you know, all the hardware coming out in the future. Um, so data frames are collections of rows with a schema. They're sort of dynamically typed. They're like the data frames you use in Python and R. So really nice for like scripting, but maybe not, uh, you know, not that great for building la large complex programs. And then data sets, which came out in 1.6, add static typing. So you can have a data set of, say, people, um, and you can view it as Java objects, but things just get converted to Java objects when you act on them. Underneath, they're still represented uh, using the binary format in tungsten, like data frames. And obviously, both run on, on tungsten. So in Spark 2.0, the main thing that we're doing is that we will merge these APIs. Both APIs were um, marked as uh, experimental, especially data set. It was still pretty new, but we think we've gotten enough experience to, um, uh, you know, to actually combine them and finalize them. And by merging them, basically a data frame will just be a special data set of objects of type row. Uh, but it's really nice to merge them just to have fewer concepts for users and libraries to worry about. Um, so an example of how you might use this, um, so, you know, say we have a bunch of classes in Scala. Same thing works in Java and Python, actually, very similar APIs. Uh, like we have users with a name and ID, and we have messages with a user in them. Um, so you can load a lot of uh, Spark's uh, input methods bring you a data frame. So you can load a data frame, say, as JSON, and this is actually a data set of row objects. And if you want to view it as message objects, you can just say data frame dot as message, and then we'll look, we'll match the fields of the message class with the fields in your JSON schema, and suddenly you have static typing. You know, you can pass this around, and like your code knows what type it is. So you get all these benefits of software engineering from static typing. 
Um, and then you can do operations on it. Looks very similar to the RDD API, and they all look like you're acting on Java objects. So for example, you can filter the messages, you can map it to users, and you get back new data sets with new types in them. Uh, this is the one part that's different from uh, you know, the current data frame API, and that is like a small API break. Currently, map on a data frame gives you back an RDD, and we're changing it to give you back a data set. So this is like the one, you know, the one like small thing that we have to fix in here. Uh, but the benefit is really nice because now this is all kind of unified. And finally, all the libraries in Spark can increasingly take data sets as input. So MLlib, you can pass your ML pipeline, just a data set of users or messages or whatever you want, and it's all set up in terms of these. So it's a really fast way to move data between different libraries. So that's what we're doing. So benefits, it's a lot simpler to understand. In fact, the only reason we didn't do this change when we released data set in 1.6 is because uh, we wanted to keep binary uh, compatibility. So we, we couldn't break um, uh, parts of the API, like the map part I talked about uh, in the 1.x series. But uh, we, can, we can do it in, in 2.x. Um, libraries will take data of both forms. So when you write a library like MLlib, you don't need to worry about like what classes the user is using if, as long as they describe their stuff in a schema you understand. So that's pretty cool. And with streaming, we think, uh, I was told it's 98.2% sure that we'll use the same class uh, data set to represent an infinite data set or a stream. So actually the same API, as long as you stick to the parts that also work on streams, uh, will work on, on streaming. And it's really cool because you can test your program you know, locally on static data and then just run it on a stream. Uh, it's again something that you don't see in, in other streaming systems. Um, so this, this, will, you know, this will come out in 2.0. Uh, so long term, uh, RDD will, will remain the low level API in Spark. If you want full control over how your data is represented as objects, what code you run and all that, RDD is the way to do it. Um, and data sets and data frames give these rich, richer semantics and optimizations. And new libraries in Spark will increasingly use these as the interchange format. Um, so as example, structured streaming and MLlib are already using them. Um, another talk you'll see, this is in the research track today, is a research project uh, between MIT and Berkeley called Graph Frames, uh, which is a uh, graph uh, API based on data frames and SQL uh, that also uses these. And I think we'll see other ones as well. All right. So this was really kind of a whirlwind tour of some of the top features in 2.0. There are a lot more th things coming, but I hope it gives you an idea of what to be excited about. And all these things I mentioned, there are detailed talks about them uh, later on today and tomorrow. So I hope you, um, you check them out. Um, so thanks again uh, for coming out to Spark Summit East, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the program. <laughs>
allows us to configure everything for you and make sure that it works end to end. Second, we could have r rapid releases. That means we could get our software out in the hands of customers every other week or every week. And the main benefit of that, of course, is that you can get feedback on the features that you're releasing. So you can iterate and learn from your mistakes much faster than if you have to build shrink wrap software that you have to ship every six months and then hope that people upgrade to that version of the software. And then finally, it enables a dynamic use case. So you can spin up environments and deploy your use cases whenever you need to. If you need 100 machines for three hours, you can do that. You can also compose your abstractions because there are already other companies that are providing you services in the cloud. So it's much more dynamic in that sense. So let me talk about the platform that we built and that we uh, GA'd last summer at Spark Summit West. So the Databricks platform comes with open source Spark. And outside of this, we also built a lot of integrations. These were features like security, governance, auditing, multi-tenancy, production jobs. These were features that we had to build for the first time in the cloud around Spark. So we did that, and they're table stakes for many enterprises. On top of this, uh, towards this goal of democratizing access, we also built an integrated workspace. The integrated workspace enabled users to collaborate, comment, um, and you know, visualize, plot, and talk directly to Spark. And all of this, of course, whether it's, uh, you can run it on top of any storage system that you have. So Spark is great at federating the queries down to Hadoop or data warehouses, or more frequently these days, storage that you have in the cloud. So let me talk a little bit about how it's used so far. And I'm gonna tell you about three use cases uh, that we've seen. The first use case is what I call just-in-time data warehouse. And over 80% of our customers use this use case. And what, what this really means is that you separate compute from storage. Uh, so Hadoop, in the early days, would combine the two. But what we do here is that we separate them. You store your data, often in the cloud, in a very elastic way. And you pay for whatever you're storing there, and it's very reliable. Simultaneously, you use the Databricks platform to launch clusters with Spark and extract insights from those. And that can be very efficient and dynamic. So I've listed here that three out of the 10 top mass media companies use this. And what they were able to do is take uh, ideas that they had and get it all the way up to an app in much shorter time. So they could shorten this from months or weeks, sometimes down to days. The second use case is on top of the just-in-time data warehouse. And it's the advanced analytics use case. And this is very common. So oftentimes, uh, companies will use machine learning or graph processing um, to build richer models and do advanced analytics. So Radius Intelligence has a talk this afternoon that's really exciting. They'll talk about how they build a very complex model using machine learning of 20 million companies out there in the world. And the final use case is a use case we see more and more, especially this year. There's a lot of excitement around real time. And you heard Matei's talk. We're doubling down on that in Spark 2.0. Um, and here, you simply build data products that stream that, that are working on real-time streams. And they can combine batch, real-time, and all the other libraries that are in Spark. Here we have a top five credit card company that's doing loan approval in real-time. So it means people apply for loans, and in real-time, it'll run machine learning and figure out whether it should approve or decline that loan. Okay, so what's the main lesson? So we've had hundreds of customers now that have used Databricks platform, and what have we learned during this time? So the main lesson is that while we've solved the technology bottleneck, there's still a human bottleneck. So companies still struggle with big data projects. And the main reason that we see is that there's a really steep learning curve for developers. It's still hard to learn this stuff. And the reason for this is, historically, development, you would do it on your own machine or in your own environment. But here, because of big data, you have to do the development close to the data. Otherwise, it won't make sense. And that's really costly and time consuming. So a lot of people struggle with, first, they have to acquire machines, pay hundreds or thousands of dollars to just get those. Then they have to set them up and configure those machines, which can take a lot of time. And then finally, to build the actual applications, they have to go through and stitch together many apps. And there might be poor documentation, and they struggle with this. So how can we get around this? How can we empower more developers um, to get access and insights from big data? So in 2014, we set out to train people and help them overcome these hurdles. So our goal was ambitious, and we wanted to train 2,000 people. And I think we hit that towards the end of the year, and we were really happy. And in 2015, we tried something a little bit different. 
we launched two massive online open courses, MOOCs, and we were overwhelmed by the numbers. Um, 125,000 people took our courses, and over 20,000 finished the course end to end, and it was an accumulated over 500,000 hours spent just learning Spark. So we were very humbled by this, and we wanted to double down on this. So we're thinking, how can we multiply this and democratize access to Spark? And this brings me to the announcement I mentioned earlier. So I'm proud to announce that today um, we'll be releasing Databricks Community Edition. What is Databricks Community Edition? It's a free edition of Databricks Spark platform. You'll get access to mini Spark clusters. These are clusters that you can freely use. Um, you'll get notebooks, dashboards, the collaborative features that we mentioned earlier, and the APIs that I mentioned. But more importantly, you also get continuous delivery of content that we will be uploading there. So you will already have access to the courses and the MOOCs that I said. That's already uploaded there. And we'll be uploading also how-tos and documentations. And this actually uses a different version of what we trained on in the last couple of days. Um, okay. Right. And that's a database logo with a community building up around it. So, uh, so I'm really happy to say that today, Every attendee that's here gets access to this. And on top of this, we're going to make it really seamless for organizations to transition if they want bigger clusters than those mini clusters I mentioned, or if they want to build production pipelines or get access to any of those uh, enterprise features like security and governance, we're going to make it easy for you to set up your own accounts, put in credit card information, and upgrade to the other professional and enterprise tiers. Okay, so without further ado, I want to welcome on stage Michael Armbrust to do a demo of Databricks Community Edition. Michael is one of the uh, main committers on the Spark project. He's the lead on SQL, so welcome. Thank you very much, Ali. I am super excited to be here today to show all of you guys some of the really cool things that you are all going to be able to do using Databricks Community Edition. Uh, as you can see, we've got my email inbox up here, and I've received my invite uh, to, to join the beta program. Everybody in the audience should be getting this throughout the day. And for those of you who are watching this on the live stream, I encourage you to head over to databricks.com where you can sign up for the wait list. We're going to be trying to expand this beta program as quickly as possible. So uh, you know, all you have to do once you get this, uh, this email is click to activate your account. It's going to take you through a sign-up flow. And uh, after that, it's going to drop you into your own personal copy of Databricks. This is your one-stop shop for creating Spark clusters, creating interactive notebooks, and learning about Spark in general. As Ali said, this is pre-populated with a whole bunch of educational content. So if you just head over to the workspace, you can start with the basics in the Databricks guide. This kind of gives you all of the, the details of using Databricks itself. How to create a Spark cluster, how to create a notebook, and even advanced topics like how to take a data frame and create an interactive visualization with it. For those of you who are just getting started with Spark, we've also got you covered. If you go back to the workspace, you'll see that we've actually got an entire college course about learning Apache Spark. This is an award-winning, massive, open online course taught by Anthony Joseph out of UC Berkeley called Introduction to Big Data with Apache Spark. We've integrated it into the workspace. So all you have to do is click on it, and you can see all of the lectures as YouTube videos that you can work through at your own pace. And really, it's even more than just watching a bunch of videos. This is a fully interactive experience. So if you click on one of the labs, you'll see that this is also an interactive notebook. And if I want to actually follow along and test my Spark knowledge, all I have to do is click on Import Notebook. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to take a copy of this and move it into my home folder inside of Databricks. And so once I've done that, I can actually go to any of the cells that contain code, and I can hit Shift-Enter to run it. And you'll notice as soon as I did that, what it did was it actually attached me to one of the Spark clusters that was already running in the cloud. So that's pretty cool. But Personally, when I try to learn something new, the, the way I like to do it is to just dive in and start analyzing some data. And when you're working with a big data product like Spark, sometimes it's difficult to find an interesting data set to get started with. But fortunately, Databricks is actually preloaded with a bunch of cool data sets. Uh, one that I think is particularly interesting is the Wikipedia clickstream data. So again, if I click on this, it's going to 
take all of the code that I need to access this data set and clone it into my home directory, into a notebook. And what you'll see is, let me kind of describe what, what this data set is all about. So this is a data set that was released by the Wikimedia Foundation. It contains aggregate statistics about all 3.2 billion requests that Wikipedia received during the month of February 2015. So just a, just a year ago, all of the requests from Wikipedia. And what they've done is they've actually aggregated it down into source and destination pairs. So you can actually track the, the flow of traffic through Wikipedia, how people are clicking from page to page. Uh, as an example, let's look at a, a visualization of what the data looks like for the, the New York City Wikipedia page. So as you can see, a majority of the traffic comes from Google, which is kind of unsurprising. But another major source of traffic is the New York State Wikipedia page. And then, you know, similarly, if we look at where people go once they're on this page, they click on other related topics like New York, Manhattan, United States. So now we understand this data set, let's actually dive in and take a look at it. So you'll see the first line of code here actually loads the data set from the Databricks uh, file system. It's already pre-populated, and we've converted it into an efficient format parquet so we can read it pretty quickly. So again, as soon as I hit Shift Enter, it attached me to my cluster. And now we can actually take a look and see what the records of this data set look like. So we'll do display clicks. And it's going to run a, a short Spark job. And you can see an example of, of the kind of data that we're going to be working with. So you can see what this is telling us is that 52 people clicked from the article Valley Parade to the list of accidents and disasters by death toll, which is uh, <laughs> pretty heavy reading. Um, so. Okay, pretty cool. So now let's try asking some more complicated statistics about this. I'm in particular curious about the flow of traffic within Wikipedia itself. So I'm gonna use Markdown to explain what I'm doing as I go along. We'll say, uh, what percent of clicks from other Wiki pages? So this is pretty easy to calculate using data frames. We'll start by calculating the total number of clicks in the data set. Clicks, and we'll calculate a sum. of all the n, and then we'll tell Spark to run that job, and then get the first entry. And then to calculate the clicks from within Wikipedia, we'll do wiki clicks equals, and we'll take the same code here, except this time we'll apply a filter to remove clicks that are coming from other sources. So where prev ID is not null, so where we actually know the page that it's coming from. So now that we've got these two numbers, calculating the percentage is pretty easy. We'll just do wiki clicks divided by all clicks, and then multiply by 100 to make it a percentage. And so as soon as I hit shift enter, it's actually firing off a distributed Spark job. It's running in the background. Uh, you can see that it's actually taken that data set and it's split it up into 39 pieces. And if we click on view, we can get a better idea about what's actually going on under the covers. It's actually doing this calculation in two different phases. One phase that is calculating the sums for each of the individual partitions, and then it's doing an exchange or a shuffle, which is collecting all the data into one place, and then calculating the total sum for all of the pages. If we look at the next job that's running, we can see it's doing something very similar, but this time it's also doing a filter to remove all of the clicks that aren't coming from Wikipedia. So pretty cool, and what we, what we learned here is that actually 33% of the traffic from Wikipedia is coming from Wikipedia itself. That's pretty cool. A lot of people just clicking on through the web, which I, I know is something I can get lost doing for a while. Um, but that actually took a while. That took, as you can see here at the bottom, that took 37 seconds to run. And Matei was talking this morning about a bunch of really cool performance improvements that are on the horizon. I think it'd be pretty cool if we could actually play around with those. So typically, using the bleeding edge versions of Spark require you to go to the Apache website, download the code, compile it, deploy it to your cluster. Uh, but fortunately, in Databricks, it's a little bit easier. I've actually pre-started a cluster running Spark 2.0. So I'll go up to the clusters menu, and I'll detach my notebook. And all I have to do is attach it instead to the Spark 2.0 cluster. And now we can ask the question, how much faster is Spark 2.0? Hopefully faster. So now that I've attached to the cluster, all we have to do is reload the data set, and then I can take exactly the same code that I was running before, and we'll paste it down here, and we'll hit run. And so it looks like it's going faster. And if we actually dive in and look at the details, you can see exactly what Matei was talking about in his keynote. 
this whole stage code gen has actually fused all of the different operators together into one very efficient operation that's taking advantage of all of the modern features in CPUs today. And so as you can see, that actually took 13 seconds, so you know, pretty fast. <laughs> Cool. So now that we're on a hyper-optimized version of Spark, let's move forward with our analysis. So the next thing I want to do is I want to select an interesting set of pages. And we can do this using SQL. Since Spark is a unified platform, we can actually kind of switch back and forth between different programming paradigms based on what's the, the, the best tool uh, you know, for any given job. So we'll say select star from clicks, and let's do some filtering here. So first of all, I'd like to exclude Google. I want to zone in on just the things that are, are coming from Wikipedia. So we'll say where prev title, not like, and then we'll exclude anything that starts with other. So that's any of the search engines. We'll also exclude traffic from the main page. It's not equal, main page, and. Now let's actually zone in on a specific set of articles. So we'll say cur title, in, and let's pick something topical, maybe uh, Donald Trump. And we probably don't want all of the clicks to the page. That'll be pretty hard to visualize. So let's just take the top ones. So we'll say order by n, so the order by the number of clicks, and we'll limit it to just the top 20. And so you can see here are the top refers to the Donald Trump web page. So now we've got this, but I actually want to do a cool visualization with it. And to be perfectly honest, I'm actually not a very good JavaScript programmer. So I'm going to do what any good programmer does, and I'm going to go to Google. And I'm going to type in Spark SQL data frame force directed graph D3. So just kind of some keywords about the type of visualization I'd like to make. And we'll see, oh, that's convenient. There's a, a link at the top. And it just so happens that there's an example of how to create this kind of graph with Spark SQL. And if this looks familiar, that's because it should. This is actually a notebook that has been published to the internet. And the coolest part about being a notebook, instead of just some fragment of code that you find on Stack Overflow, is it's actually really easy for us to take this and import it into our Databricks workspace. So this looks like a, a pretty cool visualization that I'd like to use. So if I just click Import Notebook here, it's going to give me a URL. And I can copy this URL and head back over to my workspace. And in my home directory, I can click Import. And we'll paste the URL. And what Databricks is going to do is it's actually going to go and download that HTML, parse it, and take the code and insert it into my workspace. And as you can see, there's actually kind of more than meets the eye here. Uh, we can actually see there's an entire code of, uh, library of code to create this visualization. So now that we've got that, let's actually just copy it and take it back to our original analysis where we can use it. I'm going to go here, paste it, and hit Run. And now that library has been compiled and loaded into my cluster. So now we've got a bunch of results from a SQL query, and we've got this Scala library for doing visualization. We need to combine the two. And normally this would take a fair amount of boilerplate to translate the rows into the correct format. But as Matei again was talking about this morning, there's a pretty cool feature that we debuted in Spark 1.6, but we're improving a lot in Spark 2.0 called uh, data sets. So just to kind of visualize exactly what I'm talking about, let's pull up an image here. And so what you can see is data sets are actually a really nice bridge between the semi-structured relational world and the type-safe object-oriented world. So if I just take the sample code from here, and we'll copy it. And then I can take my SQL query from above, and we'll just insert it here as the set of clicks. So equals SQL. And all I have to do to translate it into this edge format that this library is expecting is say as edge. And when I hit enter, Spark is actually going to do a mapping. It's going to tell me, do these columns names line up? Do I know how to map this data? And if it doesn't, it'll provide a helpful error message about how to fix it. So in this case, it's telling me I need to tell it which column is the source. So let's provide that mapping. So we'll say the previous title is the source. The current title is the destination. And n is the count. 
So now we hit shift enter, we have our visualization and Donald Trump is in the center exactly where he'd want to be. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's expand it to a couple more candidates. Hillary, Ron M, Clinton, and let's also add Bernie Sanders and hit shift enter again. And you can see now it's actually, and let's make this a little bit bigger so you can see the whole thing. Now you can actually see, we can actually see the interrelations between the candidates as visualized by clicks on Wikipedia. So we've got Hillary over here, and you can see that the United States presidential election, even a year ago, was a major source of traffic for all three of these Wikipedia articles. And then other candidates, uh, you know, both Bernie and Hillary actually share a bunch of traffic from the Democratic Party presidential candidates. So pretty cool that you can see this, you know, even a year ago in this data set. So now that I've got a pretty cool visualization though, I'd like to share it with some of my friends. And fortunately, collaboration is built in as a first class feature inside of Databricks Community Edition. So I'm gonna go over to settings and I'm going to add a user. So invite my friend Miles here, databricks.com, and send him an invitation. And so in Miles' inbox, he should have gotten an invitation to come and join my workspace. Uh, in the community edition, you can only share your workspace with three people, but you can actually be invited to an unlimited number of, of different workspaces. So this is a great way to collaborate on different types of uh, data analyses that you might be doing. So if we go back over to uh, this Wikipedia clickstream article here, and we can see that Miles has actually joined my workbook, and down at the bottom, I think he's already started to do some cool visualizations. And it looks like he's studying hipsters, which are strongly associated with Brooklyn. <laughs> cool, okay, so that's pretty nice. Uh, and you know, sharing with Miles was great, but there's a lot of people here, and I'd actually like to share this analysis more widely. I'd like to share it with the whole world. And this is, I think, actually probably the coolest feature of the community edition, is the ability to take any notebook that you've created, you can click publish, and what it's done is it's actually sent it out to the internet, a static copy of this, and it's given me a URL that I can share publicly with anybody in the world. So if I copy this over here, I can now go over to Twitter. I can say, check out the demo from hashtag Spark Summit Community Edition. And we'll paste that right there, and I will tweet it. So now you all have access to that code and you can do your own visualization. So if we click on this, just to see exactly what it ends up looking like, it's actually an exact copy of this, statically published as HTML that anybody can look at. So pretty cool. And here comes my favorite part of the demo, the part where we let all of you loose on Databricks Community Edition and see all the cool things you can do. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ali and Michael. That was pretty awesome. We're going to be rolling out those community edition codes for you in the next two days. I'm skeptical about one thing. I went to grad school with Michael, and we shared a cube, actually. I don't believe for one second that he's not a good JavaScript developer. <laughs> next up, we have Sean Connolly, who's the VP of Strategy at Hortonworks. Sean's going to be talking to us about bringing Spark to the enterprise. Let's welcome Sean. Good morning, Spark Summit, New York. Um, I'm Sean Conley. I, I focus on strategy at Hortonworks. Uh, so spent a good bit of my time in the uh, sort of the big data space, if you will. For those of you who don't know me, I'll sort of share two, uh, two things. I'm a longtime Philly guy, so pardon my accent. I live here on the East Coast. Um, so <laughs> exactly. So, and long-suffering Philadelphia Eagles fan. Um, I'm also an open source addict, as I like to describe myself. I've been in open source since early days JBoss, so a little over 12 years, JBoss, Red Hat, Spring Source, uh, in the last four and a half years at Hortonworks. And you know, the thrust of uh, you know, the next you know, eight or nine minutes or so is really talking about uh, how we view Spark in particular, but how do you enable open source technology to be very widely deployed across mainstream enterprises? Um, so that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in this great position where I get to see innovative open source tech 
uh, but also figure out how to translate it to the enterprise. And so uh, while the tech is cool, and I'll get into some of the thinking around the technology, it really starts with why should sort of businesses care, right? Who cares, right? And at the end of the day, you know, Spark, particularly in a uh, broader data architecture, helps those uh, enterprises unlock really enormous potential from their data, any and all form factors of data, whether that data is in motion, data at rest, or anywhere in between. And so that's what I like to focus on initially. And I'm going to tell you a few stories from the customer adoption to kind of paint that picture. And then I'll, ta I'll talk a little bit about how when we think about integrating Spark into these data architectures, whether they're real time or like 10 years of historical analysis, how does that fit and, and how can that unlock things? So the, so the first uh, example I'd like to share is uh, you know, the story of web trends. And some of you may have heard uh, the story of web trends. Over the past few years, they've been early adopters of not only Hadoop, Spark, but also a variety of other Apache open source technologies in their architecture. Um, petabyte scale problem. Um, they've been in the space of serving analytics to their customers for a while. Um, 13 billion daily events processed, latencies as low as 40 milliseconds. So this is pretty serious infrastructure. Um, you know, they were able to consolidate uh, their Spark cluster and their Hadoop cluster into one so they can actually operate it and secure it and manage it centrally. Um, they got a lot of economies of scale there. But um, what I like about their journey, and actually this visual here, has been truly a journey where they started off with data discovery and web log analysis and single view use cases. And each use case keeps building on the other as you assemble more and more data. Um, is ultimately the integration of Spark into this architecture enabled them to unlock a new product for the market, right? So it isn't just about doing really cool analytics, but they were able to identify and tap into new revenue streams. So their Web Trends Explorer is really uh, about enabling their customers to do more ad hoc data discovery scenarios um, and interact with the data you know, uh, along with the traditional Web Trends experience, if you will. Um, at scale. Um, two other ones that I'd like to use uh, is really a communications company, and that's really around monitoring channel changes as you're watching TV, being able to get targeted advertising and that kind of stuff. Um, allocate ads in real time. I've talked with a few people so far here, and this ten I've heard this story at other companies a few times, so um, you know, not a new use case. The other use case, and I love these types of use cases, is uh, you know, big data and Spark being applied to railroad companies, right? So it just is not the purview of high scale, petabyte scale, web monster type thinkers. Uh, the, you know, this particular use case is, you know, uh, I, I uh, refer to it, lovingly refer to it as a train doctor, where the trains have sensors and they're capturing images and they're really trying to make sure they stay on top of the maintenance of the rail. And so there's a lot of data, different form factors, GPS location, and other things that they're bringing in to do more real-time analysis of the rail so they can prevent accidents. I live down in the uh, Philly area. I took New Jersey Transit up here. I would like them to actually use a solution like that uh, as well, right? It was a little bumpy ride. We had to stop a few times. Um, but that's how this new age of data is changing how people fundamentally think about what they can do, what the art of the possible is. And so these are the types of use cases that inspire me when I uh, do my job as part of the Hortworks team and I work with our customers on, on use case identification, if you will. Um, so now uh, I want to share with you some of the trends. Like I said, you know, I'm an open source addict. Um, you know, uh, the technology pace of innovation is just phenomenal. Um, and I would argue that Apache Software Foundation um, played a key role not only in the age of web with the Apache uh, web server, but also in this age of data, there's just a lot of innovation in Apache, Apache Spark being one of, a perfect example of that. Um, and so the implications for making this uh, approachable by mainstream enterprise is there's clearly the data API, right? And so you'll learn a lot about things there, and I have some comments on that. Then there's sort of the enterprise readiness and hardening. How do you make it easy to use, consume, and, and familiar for sort of the mainstream? Um, and then there's more work that clearly needs to be done around data science and analytics because it is an emerging frontier, right? So there's always innovation there, and we have to enable people to get on this innovative bus, if you will, right? 
Um, you, they can't just wait for it to stop. They have to figure out how to time their entrance onto this because it's, go it's going to continue to move. So from a data API, and you saw some of the uh, earlier sessions, it's about providing that surface area for developers. And I, I've spent a, a long time in the developer ranks, right, at JBoss and Spring Source, and talking to developers. On the big data side, it's really around really innovative analytic apps, less about web and mobile. But the care and feeding for developers is very much the same. How do you give them a rich set of APIs? How is it elegant? How do you remove obstacles of adoption? Um, and then when you go to deploy it, how does it integrate uh, easily, right? Maybe abstract how it integrates. So, and Spark is a great example of that is it's able to federate data from almost any data source, right? So integration is part and parcel to getting the data in the spot where you can do interesting things with it, right? Um, and then at that point, it will be a critical tool in the enterprise toolbox where the, it'll be a natural way to develop apps. Um, the hardening, clearly there's things around HA and DR and in, in the uh, Hortonworks uh, uh, realm, we actually have two platforms, a Hortonworks data platform, which is a Hadoop-based platform that we integrate Spark with. But we also have a Hortonworks data flow offering that um, and very much uh, things like Apache, NiFi, and Kafka are sort of part of that architecture. When you use them together, you get that sort of joined up experience. But these notions of security, encryption, governance, and stuff don't go away. You have to address those, particularly for mainstream uh, enterprise. And from a scale perspective, it's not just on-premises. Um, uh, you know, we partner with Microsoft around their HD Insight service, so Spark in the cloud at global scale is important, right? And that's why the innovation continues to uh, uh, need to, you know, uh, move forward. Um, and I'll sort of close out on some of the thinking there. But um, again, my developer mentality is, how do you make the analytics development process as agile as possible, right? So it isn't, you know, uh, people use data science and at times it feels like it's an unapproachable thing. And to me, it's really about how do you enable agility? Um, how do you democratize that out and make it uh, easy and, and better tooling around that? And there's no single definition of a developer, right? You're a Scala developer, a Java developer, a Python developer, an R developer, or you're using higher level tools and you're doing more business development. So you need to make sure that you're addressing the experience across those who really want to get down and dirty, don't want tools in their way, to those who really want a great out-of-box experience at a higher level. So how do you democratize that across all layers, right? And so when we think about investing and partnering and integrating, um, these are some of the things that are top of mind. So to close out, and you know, I'll sort of encourage you to um, hit up some of the sessions, but in the area of agile analytics and data science, things like the Apache Zeppelin project, um, things like um, entity resolution uh, functions, uh, uh, you know, geospatial analytic functions are important as accelerators in that space. Um, I think there's actually a, a session later on on the Magellan geospatial library and how you think about geospatial. Um, that's important for that train example, but it's important in insurance industry and everything. Everything has a GPS location. So how do you make it easy to create those types of applications? Um, the accelerate capabilities for the enterprises, how do you make sure it integrates in a familiar way with a lot of the tools and technologies that make sense for uh, this uh, technology to integrate with? Again, there's a broader modern data architecture uh, that uh, needs to be enabled. And then always there's the, uh, the notion of continuing to innovate at the core, whether it's integrated with Hadoop, whether it's integrated with streaming technologies, how do you enable it at the core to do that really well and continue to move the pace of innovation forward? And so with that, I want to close out. Um, uh, I'll just sort of give you a, you know, just one more thing teaser. On uh, March 1st, uh, we, uh, one of our partners, HP, the HP Labs uh, folks have created some really interesting Spark technology. We'll be talking about that on March 1st. Um, so the innovation train continues, right? It never stops. Um, so just stay tuned, and with that, um, hopefully enjoy the conference, and uh, thank you for the time. Thanks a lot, Sean. Next up, we have a talk by somebody at IBM.
Anjul Bahamri is not a first-time speaker at the summits. Tonight, today, this morning, she's going to tell us about Spark as the analytics operating system. Anjul is VP of Product Dev for Platforms and Analytics at IBM. Welcome, Anjul. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, you know, a few years ago, IBM celebrated its 100th anniversary. And over this last century, many of our engineers and scientists in the labs have invented scores of game-changing technologies, uh, from mainframes to PCs, from uh, Fortran to SQL, and from Deep Blue to Watson. So we are very proud of our storied history. But you know, every technology that we have bet on and supported was not invented in our own labs. We recognize a good thing when we see one and we get behind it. So we do not have a not invented here syndrome. Uh, Linux is a prime example of that. Uh, it was in the year 2000 that IBM announced $1 billion of investment on Linux. And that really accelerated the power of innovation in the open source. The CEOs and the CIOs paid attention to it, and Linux entered the enterprise worldwide. Several years ago, we bet on another game-changing technology which we believe is as game-changing for analytics as has been Linux for the operating system. And that technology is Apache Spark. So, you know, today we are all here to celebrate Apache Spark. You know, what started six years ago as Matei Zaharia's PhD thesis at UC Berkeley's AMP Lab, as he just shared, has now 1,000 contributors and at least when I counted, at least half a million lines of code, but with the new announcements, that must have gone up. And it is entering the enterprise just like Linux did. We think at IBM that this technology is so fundamental that we think of this as the analytics operating system. And you know, why do we think that? There are many reasons for that. You know, never before have such a rich set of analytical foundational capabilities all come together in one platform, in one stack. Spark is really the single toolbox for analytics. You know, if you have structured data, you can use Spark SQL. For semi-structured, unstructured data, you can drop to Spark Core. If you have data coming from the fire hose, there is Spark Streaming. For building models, you have MLLib. You make use of machine learning. For learning from graphs of data, there is GraphX. So, you know, and the, and the beauty of this is that all of these components, they work together in a seamless manner. Um, you know, in the past, to, if you needed these kinds of capabilities, you would have needed at least half a dozen products, each with its own install configuration and nuances. And today, you just need one foundational platform, which is Apache Spark. So we at IBM, we love Spark. We are enhancing it. Um, we have the Spark Technology Center that we started in uh, San Francisco uh, last year. And here we have um, our engineers and uh, committers on Spark who are uh, you know, contributing to Spark R, to Spark SQL. They are fixing bugs. They are hardening the documentation. And we are also offering it as a part of our products, so both on-prem and on the cloud. So Spark is part of our Big Insights product. For customers who want to transition from Hadoop MapReduce workloads in a seamless manner to, to, to Spark. And we also offer it uh, on the cloud, as uh, Spark as a service. And we are leveraging, leveraging uh, the 
uh, you know, the scale and the unified programming model of Spark uh, throughout our product portfolio. So I'll give you, uh, you know, just a glimpse of uh, how we are leveraging this in our portfolio. Um, we already have about 15 IBM products that we shipped last year, which are all leveraging Spark. Over a dozen are in the works in the labs. And, uh, you know, just to give you a few examples of how our product portfolio has benefited from the expressiveness and the speed of Spark. So our ETL engine, right, and our data shaping engine, we replatformed it in one year and reduced the number of lines of code from 40 million to about 5 million. I mean, this was huge for us. For SPSS, uh, by pushing down to Spark and by leveraging MLlib and System ML, uh, which is something that uh, you know we had contributed to the open source last year, um, we are seeing about three to six x times performance improvements in the predictive model execution over hundreds of terabytes of data. Our Watson Analytics, it makes use of now these replatformed ETL and predictive analytics capabilities, and they have been able to leapfrog to interactive and visual analytics. Um, you know, I also want to take the opportunity to plug a technology that we just announced. It is called Quarks. Um, it's a platform for building end-to-end -end IoT applications. And, uh, um, you know, it's a lightweight and embeddable framework. So it's embeddable in the edge nodes. And it is tightly integrated with Spark. And we are making that available to the open source community. So moving along, let's look at, you know, how um, there are some of our customers are leveraging Spark. So IBM recently acquired... Uh, the digital assets of the weather company. And, uh, you know, you probably know them through brands like the Weather Channel or Weather.com. At its core, it's really a data company. So they provide weather data to Apple, Google, Facebook, um, Samsung, and many others. They uh, serve about 30 billion API calls every day which is almost 60 times the number of tweets that happen on a daily basis. Uh, they have about 120 million mobile users. So the chances are that you know, every time you use your phone to check the weather, anything to do with weather, you're probably going through them. So when you look at all of this data that, is, uh, that the weather company has to handle, which is generated by these API calls, uh, the mobile sessions, the page views, and the weather observations, this amounts to that they have to handle close to 360 petabytes of data on a daily basis. So for this, they needed a platform to serve this data to the users. And this platform, obviously, it ingests and aggregates and this data. Uh, they needed uh, you know, a way to crunch this data in a repeatable manner. And Obviously, there are different users working on this uh, platform, so they needed to collaborate and shorten the time that it takes to go from data discovery to insights. And the data has to be processed and analyzed in both uh, batch as well as in a, uh, using streaming. So they use a Lambda architecture for that. And of course, Spark is at the heart of this, right? So they make use of Spark Streaming, Spark Core, Spark SQL, and for uh, NoSQL store, they make use of uh, Cassandra. And uh, with Spark, what they have been able to build is this platform which handles 360 petabytes of data. It is linearly scalable and it is cost effective. Um, there's a session uh, by Robbie Strickland uh, today, and you can learn more about it. You know, Robbie has been a part of the team at TWC that has made this happen. Now, let's move on to Spark in medicine. So in our Watson Health portfolio, we have a solution called Explorus. And Explorus enables healthcare providers to build data lakes. And then they use these data lakes to improve the way healthcare is delivered. So Explorus as a platform 
that can collect, combine, gain insights from data that is coming from a lot of uh, data sources. This could be clinical data, operational or financial data. Uh, this data is coming from both the sources which are inside the enterprise as well as from the external network. And um, you know, we call this the healthcare enterprise because it represents the convergence and standardization of big data that is both inside and outside the enterprise. And Explorers has just started using system ML. And let me just tell you a little bit about system ML at a very high level. Uh, think of this as the SQL for machine learning. And it also has um, machine learning algorithm optimizer. So this is something that we had contributed to the open source and we are trying to integrate this with MLM. Um, so on top of system ML, which is running on uh, Spark, they have built risk models. And these risk models, now they are able to um, predict adverse medical events and alert the doctors in a timely manner. So another client of ours, um, this is a telco ISV, and they are helping their customers, which are large telecoms, uh, improve customer satisfaction rates. So today, the customers, when they are interacting with the telcos, or for that matter, any business, it could be over voice, it could be email, it could be chats, it could be web, live chats, uh, text, or even tweets. So often the same customer is using different channels to interact with the business. And sometimes if they have to repeat the same information across those channels, it gets um, frustrating for the customer. So this ISV has built a platform that creates a 360 degree view for each customer. They stitch all the interactions across all the channels that the customer is having with the business. And this they call as the customer experience journey. And then they analyze this journey data to extract sentiment and take any necessary actions. So once again, Spark is at the center of this platform. So Spark streaming is bringing the data together um, into a single processing pipeline. Spark Core is being used to perform text ex extraction and voice processing. And they used to use MapReduce for this before. So by going to Spark Core, uh, they are seeing about a speed up of 4x times compared to Hadoop MapReduce. MLLive is being used for correlation and sentiment analysis. And then they are using Spark SQL uh, to drive visual dashboards for interactive query and reporting. So this is, and the benefit is that the customer satisfaction rate is being increased. So these are just a few examples of how the various elements of the Spark stack are coming together to provide complete solutions to handle large amounts of data and be able to do analytics and deliver value to the business. So, you know, for those of you who are already um, on Spark, I would say welcome to the revolution. And for those of you who have a big data problem and are trying to decide which technologies would help you, try Spark. Thank you. Thank you.